person. I've done a lot of writing, journal articles, conference papers, books, um, so on and so forth on why uh, technical areas, for example, Internet of Things, um, cyber security, connected vehicles, smart system, communication systems, and so on and so forth. I worked on uh, multiple funded projects as principal investigator. Uh, my broad research area is on cyber security and different uh, verticals, use cases of cyber physical systems. I've worked on a physical layer um, security, encryption algorithms for a communication link, uh, various framework for IoT. So, I think that gives me uh, a bit to then refer to. Uh, Huddersfield uh, is here, pointed here, right uh, in the middle of uh, um, in, uh, England, UK. That top bit, can you see? Oh, well, the cursor is not moving. So, the top bit is Scotland. Uh, the bit on the left, the extension uh, after Birmingham, is Wales. And then the rest is England, okay? And England, Wales, and Scotland uh, becomes United Kingdom. Okay, that's uh, a bit complex. But, yeah, we have got, uh, and then we have got Northern Ireland as well. So again, it makes it even more complex. But right now, uh, if you look into Huddersfield, uh, we are very close to Manchester, the city that many of you know, okay? Because it has got Manchester United and Manchester City. Huddersfield also has a football club, but not many of you know that because they don't play for any Premier League. But anyways, uh, Manchester is one hour uh, from, sorry, Huddersfield is one hour from uh, Manchester Airport. So if you um, are planning to come to Huddersfield, then uh, you will fly from Hanoi to, uh, to arrive at Manchester Airport, okay? And then from there you will take a train which takes around one hour. Um, dial train. So very convenient. The city itself, Manchester City, uh, where you have got the two football club, uh, it will be around 35 minutes uh, only from Huddersfield. <coughs> and uh, to London, London is at the bottom, um, you see, uh, and it is around two and a half hours from Huddersfield on train. So it's a um, great location right at the heart of England and uh, very easily um, commutable from uh, key major cities. It has its own advantage, for example the living cost which is uh, very low uh, as compared to other cities like Manchester or London which I will talk about. So Huddersfield itself is a beautiful, vibrant, historic town. As you can see, lots of historical building. The landscape is, is, is beautiful, surrounded by um, you know, a very nice landscape, similar to Vietnam as well. Vietnam, I must say, has got probably better landscape than that. But uh, we are also very proud of the landscape that you uh, see in, in, in UK. In fact, when I uh, take a train um, in UK uh, and just going through these landscape, Provided the day is sunny, uh, it looks amazing. Okay, so that's a thing to experience as well. Um, from Huddersfield University point of view, uh, these are some of the buildings that we have, and you can see it's a mix of uh, you know traditional refurbished uh, buildings where we have refurbished uh, uh, historic mills to become um, our um, buildings and some. Uh, are very modern, for example, the one on, on the bottom right, which is the Oysler building. Um, so more than 100 million pound investment in campus facilities over the uh, few years. Uh, from a uh, student's point of view, we have got uh, more than 3,000 international students coming from more than 120 different nationalities. And we have got, uh, I think that number has increased from 19,000, that's probably uh, old data that I did not change, but yes, yeah, similar uh, in terms of uh, number of students in, in your uh, university. So, uh, from uh, why choose Huddersfield, this is a marketing slide, and we have got lots of different you know awards that we are really proud of 
the, the top one being the TEF Gold, which is Teaching Excellence Framework Gold Award uh, that we have recently actually secured again. Uh, and, and what happens in UK is um, uh, the teaching uh, quality gets um, uh, assessed and categorized by the UK government. And, uh, and, you, uh, and Huddersfield has been given the top award, which is the gold award, okay? And we sit together with uh, universities like University of Oxford. So we are really, really proud of that achievement. And then you can see other things as well, for example, placement, uh, uh, international student growth, uh, and, and, and other things. The 95% graduate employment is the overall university statistic, which is again uh, very nice to see. We have got a dedicated international office who provides full support uh, before you come and uh, you know, after you come during your studies. Quite a lot of uh, events happen. There are um, sports tournaments, film festival, you know, uh, lots of these. Uh, uh, festivals that happen and it's an opportunity to explore all these different cultures uh, that are um, you know as I said earlier we have got students coming in from 120 different countries so as you can so imagine that gives you opportunity to to experience that wide range of different cultures from subject areas, these are some of the areas that we cover. Electronic engineering, mechanical automotive, computing, music technology and production, games and wave. Um, and uh, computing will, will cover, you know, from I, information technology, network, cyber security, uh, and, and AI, machine learning, data science, uh, uh, quite diverse. From qualifications uh, point of view, uh, undergrad, top of, integrated masters, MSc, research, uh, up to PhD. Um, so different uh, entry points uh, from foundation, undergraduate degree, top of masters and PhD. So there are multiple entry points available based on your requirement, your need and, and, and what you want. you will be provided with uh, pre-sessional English and also uh, in-sessional support when you are actually doing the course you are also provided with the support so uh, you know you are uh, very well supported in that sense um, some of the master scores that we uh, currently have um, you know from AI to computing cybersecurity data science automotive information systems management 
um, engineering, management, mechanical, and, and also there are research options as well. The reason I put it here is because we have got uh, for January intake, the deadline is 27th October. So if you know someone who is interested to apply, then that's the date. Uh, that we, we we must receive the applications by okay and then for next year as well it will be similar we have got two entry point for msc with uh, september and january um, so i'm just going to provide now a bit of overview on the transfer programs that we currently have in arrangement with ptit to come to huddersfield university okay so these are um, the list of programs that is on the arrangement of one plus three. What that means is uh, you finish your first year at PTIT and then come to do three years at Huddersfield University to complete the, the program and then get awarded uh, the degree from Huddersfield University. So one year at PTIT plus three years at Huddersfield. This is one plus three model. So we have got Electronic and Electrical Engineering BNG, Bachelors of Engineering, Electronic and Communications Engineering, Electronic Engineering and Computer Systems, Electronic Engineering, and so these are for uh, engineering programs, and we have got one plus three for Information Technology, BSc, Bachelors of Science, and then we have got Computer Science with Cybersecurity, and we also have computer science with artificial intelligence. Okay, so you will be doing three years at Huddersfield, um, which is, um, I think, will be very amazing experience. I can definitely tell you that. So we have got few more people. So let them settle in. Okay, so let's get, a, get, get settled very quickly at the back there. Thank you for joining uh, me, uh, even though you are running around uh, with your other lectures. I know you are very busy people, so thank you. I'm very, very grateful for you being here, okay? So thank you very much. Um, so for the benefit of those who joined in late, I am Rupa Karel. Uh, I am from Huddersfield University and I am professor of cyber security there so hopefully I can talk a bit about my research area okay so uh, so you can get some idea on some of the research projects that I'm currently doing and you can also be part of um, so this particular slide is actually very um, very much of interest to you it should be because these are the transfer programs currently in place uh, from PTIT to Huddersfield. So you can quickly look at that. So this arrangement I was saying earlier um, is for uh, one plus uh, three arrangement, okay? So you can see we have got quite a lot of uh, agreements, arrangements in place already for you to finish uh, first year here and then join Huddersfield uh, for three years. Um, and since you'll be coming for three years, uh, you will also have uh, an opportunity to, to do a placement year after studying two years at Huddersfield. So, uh, so you come uh, study for two years and then on the third year you can actually go for a placement year and I'll cover that uh, a bit more in detail uh, in a few slides later. Okay, so that's uh, the one plus three arrangement that we have got here uh, from PTIG to Huddersfield. Okay, so moving on to the other slide, which uh, uh, is for a different type of arrangement, which is three plus one model. Um, and in this model, probably you uh, can guess, you do three years in uh, PTIT, uh, and then you come uh, for the final year, uh, which we call a top of the year, uh, and finish off your program at Huddersfield and then you will uh, get awarded Huddersfield University course, okay? So again, uh, quite um, interesting and uh, exciting opportunity there. So you can 
finish your three years here and then come for the final year uh, to Harder School University. Uh, this doesn't have placement opportunity because you would come after the placement year already finishes, okay? So just to, to keep that in mind. Uh, to provide a bit of uh, information on placements, um, the OnePlus 3 offers placement opportunity, like I said earlier, a chance to undertake an op optional placement in year 3. This is optional, it's really important, it's your choice. If you want to do it, then um, you have that opportunity and you can actually work full time for up to 12 months, okay, and get paid um, quite handsomely uh, that as well. Um, in UK, so um, it helps you build on the knowledge and the skills that you have developed, uh, uh, you know, within up to two years of your course, and you will be employed by a company of by up to 12 months. Uh, so it's quite valuable too. Uh, that will enhance your employability and help you uh, develop as an individual, as a, as a professional. Okay, it is and normally acknowledged that graduates who uh, come out with industry experience with the placement year, they are generally much more attractive to employers. And I don't think that's of any surprise, isn't it? Because you know somebody who is coming out of education and already has a year of experience in the back. So of course it will make uh, you know it attractive from employer's perspective. So if I have to advise, I would definitely. Uh, advise you to uh, take the placement year if you have that opportunity. We have got a dedicated placement unit uh, uh, that will be uh, providing support right from uh, finding the suitable opportunities for you uh, through timetable sessions uh, and drop-in sessions. They will also help you uh, work on your CV uh, and interviews and so on and so forth. And even after uh, you are uh, the air in placement, we will have academics visiting. Um, any problems there, boys? Excuse me? Uh, any, any questions for me? Okay. Yeah, please, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, there will be helps available for CVs and interviews and uh, once you are in the placement uh, uh, period then academic uh, staff actually come and check on you uh, regularly so that you are actually uh, you know, treated very well and provide, uh, you, know, you are provided with uh, good opportunity for development because that's the whole point of you being at the placement year. So we, we actually check on that. Uh, some of the experiences uh, shared by our students uh, for uh, different programs that uh, uh, we have that arrangement in place. Uh, for example, information technology um, placement uh, student Lucas Hutton, uh, he, he is talking about uh, being fortunate at a placement at Leeds Council. Leeds is very near to uh, Huddersfield and how he got to uh, work as a web developer on a number of uh, complex applications and how it taught him brains of skills um, that helped him uh, further the knowledge that he already had. Okay, so again, quite uh, a good um, statement from, from one of the students. The other one is computer science. Um, so again, similar uh, experience being uh, shared uh, where uh, you know the problem solving skills, the investigation of problems, um, working with other um, staff members, very, very important aspect of employment. Um, so that has been shared. Um, the student um, going into placement from the program electronic and electrical engineering. Um, so she, she went to work with a company that develops uh, radiation detectors. Again, uh, quite interesting area of work. Um, and uh, she kind of said that uh, she got to work at various stages of product development and uh, then she also understood about various different carriers that are available as, as a result of that. So again, quite interesting to see these students' experience and they benefiting uh, greatly and hugely um, in terms of their professional development. 
um, some statements from our uh, employers actually, uh, and uh, they have actually uh, highlighted and praised um, the the placements that has come from uh, the University of Huddersfield, um, and they, these are regular employers. Okay, so they will uh, put out placement opportunities every year to take uh, our students. So as you can see, we have got quite a good network uh, in terms of um, uh, employers. So again, uh, I will not go through those um, now, but that kind of highlights the opportunities and the support that, that uh, you get. to look at what happens then after you graduate. Uh, that employability number is also very important after you uh, pass out from uh, the university. Um, and we have actually quite high employability rate for all the courses that we have got, all the programs that we have got uh, in place, uh, the arrangement in place with PTIT. We have got more than 85% of employability. Uh, and for some, it is as high as 90%. I think the information um, technology course has got more than 90 percent employability rate. So it's very uh, interest, uh, very attractive. If someone is interested in applying for research, uh, that is for uh, let's say for PhD, there are uh, you know time and again there are scholarships available. For example, if you come to um, our undergrad program you finish with uh, more than 60 percent of the marks then you are eligible to directly enroll for PhD actually you do not have to go through LSE. Um, uh, everybody I, I do expect a bit of quietness please if you uh, excuse me 
Yeah, just, just focus here, please. Thank you. So there may be fee waivers available. Uh, there are time and again PhD students if that covers uh, the tuition fee uh, home rate and then provides a generous stipend per annum. Uh, and right now I think it's around up to 18,000 pound per annum. Okay, so very generous. Uh, but of course uh, it is very competitive. Uh, but if you don't try, you don't get it. Um, so again, that's the process on how to apply for research if you are uh, interested. Now, just to quickly go through the School of Computing and Engineering, uh, I think there has been some uh, problems because I made the slides on my MacBook and the transfer has kind of done something with the slides, but I think we can still see. Uh, so this is the School of uh, Engineering, Computing and Engineering building. Uh, my office is just there, the, the third floor, um, and on, on the right, sorry, on the left. Um, so that's, that's, that's the building. In engineering, uh, sorry, in School of Computing and Engineering, we have got uh, two disciplines that we divide, Computer Science and Engineering. And in Computer Science, these are the current research centers uh, that we have. Uh, and these are all world-class leading applied research group, uh, Center of Mathematics and Data Science. Um, we look into the data modeling side of things. We look into um, understanding of the processes uh, and, and so on. Uh, the Center of Cyber Security, you know, looking to um, develop and demonstrate advanced knowledge that is beneficial to understanding and mitigating cyber threats. Again, we have got very close links with industry to work on this. Uh, we also apply uh, emerging algorithms such as uh, AI uh, within the context of cyber security. So the center, center of planning, autonomy, and representation of knowledge. Here uh, we talk about reasoning, um, ontological engineering. We, we look into um, um, solving applied problems uh, with large amount of data um, and apply it into various areas such as uh, autonomy, transport, um, machine, uh, biomedical, and, and so on. Uh, center of Visual and Immersing Computing, where we work on you know, technologies such as AR, VR, and, and those sorts of things as well. I think uh, this is something that uh, uh, will be of interest for people here, because I hear that we have got very strong multimedia. Uh, and then the other one is Center for Industrial Analytics, where we focus on uh, application of uh, technology within the industrial context and moving towards Industry 4.0. Uh, these are research areas for engineering, um, Center of Precision Technologies, EMMA, Materials, Railway Research, Institute of Railway Research is actually one of the top one in, in, in the whole UK, so we are actually very proud of having that within our university. Um, so. So these are some of the facilities that we have got within the university, all the labs, facility, uh, works of facilities, uh, state of the art uh, facilities, um, that's for the music technology. So that's a bit of overview about uh, Huddersfield University, the arrangements that we have with PGIT and Huddersfield, so hopefully that has been helpful. So now what I will do is I'll jump um, straight into the topic in hand. Um, so probably um, 30 to 30, 40 minutes I will take uh, for this talk. Um, so, so are we ready for this? Yes? Okay. I can see quite a lot of movement at the back. So uh, after that brief introduction about myself and, and Huddersfield, uh, let's start with the topic uh, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the digital revolution and uh, you know, we all you know, live in such a hyper-connected world these days where almost all devices are connected to internet one way or other. So we are constantly leaving our footprints, digital footprint that is. Um, in you know in, in the internet either knowingly or non-knowingly 
Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room has got a device that's connected to internet, at least one, if not more. You know, mobile being one of the mobile phone being one of the uh, the common one. And we have got laptops, smartwatches, and you know, we also have got devices that are connected to internet at, at home, at, at, at you know, companies, industries, and so on. For example, smart speakers, smart bulbs, smart uh, you know, cameras, uh, smart. Uh, doorbells and, and, and so on and so forth. The use case is unlimited. We even have smart toasters to toast our bread, smart microwave, smart fridge, which is absolutely crazy actually. But anyways, so that gives rise to Internet of Things. Things are getting connected to Internet. And if you look on the chart there, the proliferation of technology uh, from 1960s, we have you know mainframes and and mini computers and we were talking about million units at that time and now we are talking about tens of billions of units uh, you know uh, fueled by internet of things so what that means is uh, this is actually creating opportunity from cyber criminals point of view because they have got such a large devices to kind of uh, you know uh, do something wrong with hack and, and, and get the data out of and you know target with spams and so on um, the other thing, interesting thing, is if you look on the sectors, uh, you know, the bottom one, the technology is uh, the digital transformation, the digital revolution is happening through almost all sector that we know. So that's impacting everything that we, we, we do, everything that we know about in the society. So healthcare, technology, financial services, automobile, industrial, energy, retail, consumer, government, aerospace, you know, if I have missed something there, you know, it, it's it's no doubt uh, it's also um, affected by digital transformation. So all these things are possible by uh, the essential uh, emerging technology. For example, IoT, AR, VR, blockchain, AI, 3D prints, drones, robotics, and so on. Uh, these are some of the essential emerging, and there are other emerging technology as well that are. Uh, there. So, so uh, what this means is uh, no matter what sector that we operate on, uh, we need to be aware of all the threat vectors, you know, something that uh, gives us that risk, uh, the threat landscape, the weak links, for example, of this particular system. Because, yes, technology gives us innovation um, and it's about exploiting these innovation, but these uh, opportunity of digital revolution will also bring challenges, and the key one is cyber security. So this uh, slide is again very interesting because it shows impact from financial damage. Okay, and and uh, and if you look into the global cyber damage in 2021, 4.3 trillion pound. By 2025, it's expected to double almost to 7 trillion pounds. And this is actually more than many countries' uh, GDP. So that's quite, uh, you know, a uh, uh, number that are highly um, threatening from, uh, you know, uh, from, from society, from countries' point of view. If we look into only the ransomware, ransomware is one type of cybercrime. Uh, and ransomware, probably you, many of you know, uh, it's like uh, you know, in, 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 in a traditional the ransom, uh, what happens is uh, the criminal will kidnap someone and then they will ask for, okay, if you don't give this much amount of money, we'll do such and such, right? Um, so that's the ransom. But in the digital world, the ransomware, it means that the, the, the criminal there have got hold of the data, the, the infrastructure, the, the the device, the computers, for example, they lock you out, they lock us out, and they will not let us in unless we pay up, uh, you know, ransomware, and mostly by use of uh, bitcoins, for example, and cryptocurrencies. So, so again, that's that's really worrying. Uh, and from numbers point of view, you can see that the the ransomware damage has also been quite quite uh, quite a lot. Um, Six billion people will connect to the internet by 2022. You know, that has already happened. And by 2030, 10 billion internet users. You know, almost everyone in the globe will be connected to the internet. Okay, so, so that's, um, that's another interesting thing from, from cyber security point of view. And 
And we, we, we already are seeing that uh, there are three times more uh, IoT devices connected to internet than human population right now. And, and in the next 20 years, there, there will be uh, almost 40 uh, trillion IoT devices. Now that's like a lot. Okay, so that, what that means is uh, IoT devices is going to uh, increase uh, the cyber attack surface Okay, uh, the the surface that the, the the criminal can work on it will expand more and more and more because of the number of devices that's connected to the internet. So the cybersecurity is is, is now becoming uh, like uh, epidemic. For example, similar to uh, COVID nineteen, where it was epidemic, it was a healthcare crisis, but. Cyber security is now epidemic. We don't even know. It doesn't affect us as in from mobility point of view. You know, we are not in a lockdown state, but actually it is epidemic. We see quite a lot of challenges from cyber security. And these numbers is already kind of resonating those. Yes, digital transformation is the future. However, uh, without considering cyber security, digital transformation cannot exist. It's not sustainable. Okay, so hence, um, cyber security becomes a very very exciting area. So that's the la last uh, um, paragraph in there. Digital transformation can only exist together with cyber security. No more plugging in cyber security at the end. Technology maturity and cyber security need to go in parallel and hand in hand. That's really important message for us to understand, being a technical person. We can't come up with a solution uh, to solve a problem anymore. It's not enough. If that product doesn't have cyber security consideration, once it goes to mass market, then it's not going to uh, you know, um, be any help. Actually, it's going to cause more damage than, than being of any help. So okay, that's another thing. And it's really important for people uh, working in technology to understand. Uh, for example, if you are working on web, uh, then you need to understand web security. If you are working on Android app, mobile, you know, iOS app, and any other application, then you need to understand about uh, the vulnerabilities and, and so on and so forth. If you are working about, you know, with database, then you need to understand about those um, security aspects and then the solutions. Okay. Uh, and also with network, uh, network infrastructure and so on. Yes, just plugging, being able to make a network work is not enough. You need to understand how to make it secure. Okay, it's about making a building and then also making sure that it doesn't allow intruders in or doesn't allow anyone to come and knock it off. Uh, you know, uh, so that security aspect is, is very important. So that's uh, that's a number which uh, you know was not there to 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 scare people off. I think uh, that's very important for from. Uh, from our point of view to understand about opportunity, okay? Now, what does opportunity mean for, for you, uh, from a student's point of view? Opportunity means you need to be able to get and enter into the market in this field and be able to make uh, a good career out of it, right? So that's what it is. And uh, when we look into cyber security market, um, and this, I'm not talking about uh, from criminal point of view. Okay, this is pure legit, legitimate market. Uh, the companies are offering cybersecurity solutions, and uh, the market has increased uh, double. Uh, well, uh, it's expected to increase from 2020 to 2026, almost double, and quite uh, you know huge numbers there. Just to put uh, some uh, big players in terms of cybersecurity companies. Um, and since they have gone public, um, there has been tremendous interest and growth in their stocks uh, as well. For example, 14 and 34 times, you know, after they were, uh, after they uh, 
uh, were floated into the stock market and uh, let's say if I had put uh, $10,000 then, then I'd be sitting here today with three and a half million dollars. That would be very interesting. Well, I did not do that, okay? So, yeah, which is the same. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is the, the opportunity, the market is, is, is huge. And then look at this one from a skill sorter's point of view and this would be of interest to you. Yes, there is demand of cybersecurity. The market is growing. There are so many vulnerabilities, you know, uh, we need protection from. Uh, we talked about this digital transformation and IoT and how much it is going to have problem from cybersecurity point of view, but then there are not enough people in the area. There is, you know, shortage, um, and hence it makes it even more uh, should make even more exciting from a student's point of view, okay, to be in this field. Okay, so so that's kind of a bit of overview uh, from cybersecurity uh, impact, problem and opportunity uh, from from uh, you know from everyone involved to you know, from from everyone for everyone who is thinking to get into uh, this area. So now I move on to my research, okay. Uh, because what I said earlier was when we talk about digital revolution, when we talk about uh, next generation digital transformation, when we talk about that technological adoption into newer areas, newer use cases, then we need to talk about cyber security and that's my research area. I focus on um, future mobility infrastructure. The first one is connected and autonomous vehicle um, uh, paradigm and this will be a typical kind of uh, I mean we still see this uh, but uh, the difference is uh, it's 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 a cyber physical world the cyber world and physical world is, it will be connected the vehicles will be talking with vehicles V2V vehicle will be talking with infrastructure with with services with people with resources um, and we will witness um, uh, the paradigm called internet of vehicles or connected and autonomous vehicle concept, CAV. And we will find in the future that the vehicles will be self-sufficient assets that will be able to self-drive, autonomous, um, and make all safety critical uh, decisions utilizing various uh, enabling technologies such as AI, imaging, and, and so on and so forth. And then these vehicles will be connected uh, you know, with uh, connected, you know, uh, network uh, communication uh, technologies uh, with each other, you know, that V2X paradigm. So vehicle, one vehicle will be talking with another vehicle. The vehicle will be talking with um, the traffic lights, for example. Um, the vehicle will be talking about the emergency vehicle that's probably coming from behind so that they can give way so that emergency vehicle can pass through. So all these decisions, all these communications are also happening. For example, uh, one vehicle uh, there waiting, you know, sees the traffic light turning into red and, and, and it starts to break. That intention of braking should be then passed on uh, to the vehicles that's following, right? So that communication needs to happen. The problem with that uh, is, um, some of the research that I focus on is the location saving aspect where uh, how do we ensure that the location that has been claimed by the vehicle that says I am here and hence the other vehicles will stop how do we make sure that that location claim is valid maybe the location uh, the other car is saying is not is not valid because it has been hacked and then uh, the, the, the car is not where it is it's probably uh, you know, uh, 10 meters further or wherever. So then it means that uh, there will be something wrong that can happen, like the crashes can happen and so on. So that's very important, location, um, ensuring location claim. And when somebody puts the location out in, in, in the, the uh, you know, communication channel, how do we make sure that the privacy aspect is there? So again, we need to make sure that the access control, that uh, cryptographic algorithms, the encryption is, is happening um, and only the legitimate users are uh, getting those um, information. The other uh, key challenge, and maybe you have seen this in movies and so on, 
uh, the vehicle suddenly gets hijacked and someone, uh, you know, the hacker takes control of the vehicle and then is running around with the, the vehicle, you know, creating havoc. How do we ensure that no malicious access to the vehicle happens? Uh, and this gives concept of virtual vehicle hijacking and how do we mitigate that? So again, that's, that's of interest for me in terms of my, uh, in terms of my uh, research. So, so there is a significant research still uh, happening in, in here. Uh, this is a futuristic uh, mobility uh, you know, paradigm, infrastructure and uh, very essential to uh, realize a secure uh, is the future. Uh, this is the future. Okay, connected and autonomous vehicle will, will, will be here in next 15-20 uh, years. Okay, so uh, when that happens, uh, we need to, when we are talking about this technological development, that security should be embedded within. Okay, so uh, that's one of the research area that I'm currently focused on. Um, well, I just put the benefits of uh, connected and autonomous vehicle just to kind of, uh, you know, uh, excite you a bit more. Um, it will have enhanced safety, for example, by reducing accidents caused by human errors, reduced congestion because now suddenly it becomes an algorithm where uh, the cars are traveling because these are autonomous vehicles, they can choose where to go, they can look into, you know, all these cars are talking with each other, we don't need to look at Google Map, you know. Uh, to understand about the traffic condition, how does Google Map work? How does it know about real-time uh, traffic conditions? Because all the users in the car actually are sending data onto the cloud, and Google is making that real-time uh, decision to show us that red line, right? Uh, to say that there is traffic condition. Now all those things will happen automatically within the vehicle. They don't have to. Uh, you know, users will not have to look at the Google Map at all, for example. So again. That will uh, allow optimization of traffic flow, reduction of jams, and so on and so forth. Increase efficiency because now the, the vehicle can take the route that has got, uh, you know, that takes us to a destination quicker and with uh, uh, less uh, fuel uh, uses. And accessibility, this is again very important. This is autonomous vehicle now. Uh, currently, you have got your Grab app that you you know, hail a cab, for example. Now you can do the same, but instead of the driver driving uh, to us, autonomous car will come and take us to wherever we want to go, like robot taxis. Okay. Um, so, uh, an autonomous vehicle are now part of society. How can we make sure that that user adoption takes place? Okay, so again, quite an um, uh, important uh, aspect. And uh, you, know, you, as a technical person, can play a role on that actually, become uh, like an advocate for uh, the technology and, and, and uh, you know, talk about. Um, the technology and, and the safety aspect and the privacy and so on aspect of particular technology so so it has got wider acceptance. Um, so these are some of the generic uh, cyber security challenges from uh, CAV context and uh, you know I'll just leave that there for you to uh, quickly uh, go through and I'm not going to cover all of them. One interesting, uh, two interesting things I'd like to point out is the secure software and the human factor vulnerabilities. Uh, secure software because, uh, like I was saying earlier, everything, the software needs to be secure. There is no point creating a software that is not secure. So again, that uh, security by design aspect becomes very important, okay? The other one, human factor vulnerabilities. Now. Human being, at the end of the day, uh, we are the end user, and most of the time, the failure point of any system is the human being. For example, email comes with you know malicious attachment, then it's the user, the human being clicks on it. Okay, so understanding about why human um, behave in a particular way, it's it's very important how they behave when a certain technology is, is put in front of them. I think that's really important. And that's what I was talking about earlier, about that psychological uh, research. Again, very interesting. Why someone uh, can fall victim of 
a cyber scam or uh, you know from a cyber criminal. I mean that that is very interesting um, research. Why anyone wants to become a hacker, for example? Yes, of course, uh, you know, criminals uh, they want to make quick money. That's one uh, aspect of it. But what makes a hacker a hacker? I think that's again very interesting. Uh, um, study um, and that is I think uh, cyber psychology again one of my uh, I collaborate with colleagues from psychology and we are working into um, something to understand that that human psychology uh, from cyber security point of view um, so these are some of the mitigation strategies and solutions highly uh, top level uh, again uh, and, and, and if you zoom into each of these, it will give quite a lot of uh, research uh, questions. For example, intrusion detection system. Now, intrusion detection system on connected and vehicle, autonomous vehicle is, is, is a very uh, hot research topic. Uh, it's very much different than a normal network because these uh, um, cars are moving um, with high speed, with uh, you know, uh, newer uh, communication technologies that did not exist before just because it needs that low latency, low delay kind of uh, networking technologies. Um, the other one is cyber security training and there are, you know, as you can see, a uh, few uh, in there that I have listed. Um, cyber security training will involve bringing human in the loop of uh, the, the technology. So how can human be part of the technology? So again, that aspect is also uh, highly important. Um, oh, what happened? I pressed on end. Sorry. Um, so. So from vehicular communication challenge, now this is my research and interest. Um, there are few uh, vehicular communication challenge, uh, security, spectrum management, interference, mobility, standardized protocol, latency. My interest is on uh, security interference in particular, uh, and uh, we are slowly moving towards also spectrum management, uh, you know, on uh, beyond 5G technologies. And some of the research contributions that uh, we have had, um, we have worked on is, is to understand about the effect of interference fading and uncertainty of eavesdropper location. Now this is a, a vehicular uh, network where we have got a source and a destination and we also have got eavesdropper. Uh, and then we have got other vehicles that acts as interference. So we actually, then we looked into the joint effect of interference fading and uncertainty um, of the eavesdropper location and we looked into security and interference risk uh, because of the spatial and frequency proximity uh, and we looked into the expression uh, for uh, secrecy capacity and secrecy out is probability and it has been reported on uh, these uh, publications so if you are interested you can have a look at that so this this was uh, a preliminary work that we did um, and some of the results, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, validate the work uh, that we did, which I'm not going to cover right now. Uh, so again, some more results to look into the secrecy capacity and, uh, you know, other metrics. So that's one of the work. Uh, I mentioned about uh, smart spectrum management, and this is uh, highly uh, interesting because reconfigurable intelligent surface is going to be one of the uh, enabling technology for beyond 5G system and this is going to be featured quite heavily on uh, VANET network and RIS are man-made surfaces of electromagnetic materials that are electronically con controlled um, and it helps us uh, achieve smart radio environments at that physical layer and it helps us to control the propagation environment to improve the signal quality and coverage. So, um, you know, it's software defined uh, and it, it, it makes it um, quite useful uh, in terms of uh, integrating onto the walls of building infrastructures and vehicle. Um, why it makes it uh, attractive for using vehicle network because uh, it can easily be deployed on uh, with flexible configuration 
uh, in various several uh, shapes, for example, the, those two buildings completely different, but then again we can employ these um, risks. Um, and then with the flexibility of risk, uh, it, it can help us to enhance um, the signal names or suppress um, based on, on, on the users. So suddenly we have uh, you know, the smart spectrum management, but also we can have uh, the physical layer security okay, within the purpose of network. So again, um, makes it quite uh, dual, uh, gives, gives that dual purpose. Um, some of the application on, on, on what risk can be used as, I'm more interested on the B, physical layer security, um, D, which is massive uh, device to device, and then the, the final one, more address information and power transfer, because uh, in IoT network, IoT has a problem of battery life, okay? We can't have an um, IoT device unless it's deployed at home. If, if it's a remote, remotely deployed IoT device, uh, we can't uh, always plug IoT device to mains. You know, we can't power it that way. We either have to uh, install batteries, which will run out. Then, if we are talking about tens of billions of IoT devices, for a particular use case, we are talking about thousands, right? How, how much time it takes to go around and find all these devices to change the batteries. It's impossible. The other possible solution is energy harvesting, again quite sophisticated and, and costly technology. Other solution is to put uh, solar panels, again uh, very costly. The other solution is to um, have power transfer, um, wireless power transfer together with information transfer. So RIS actually allows that wireless information and power transfer. And we have done some work in this as well. Um, so this one is, is a very preliminary work of the use of uh, RIS that is mounted on the building and you, we have got the eavesdropper and the destination and the source. Um, um, and we used uh, the building mounted RIS as a relay in this uh, vanish scenario. In the other case, we have got uh, the RIS transmitter on the source vehicle and, and we actually investigated the physical layer security for both the models. Okay? There are lots of uh, uh, caveats and, and challenges with this uh, preliminary work because of course uh, you know, having risk at one building, the building doesn't move. So we need to have this risk transmitter at, at many buildings along the way. Um, but this is uh, this was one of the uh, preliminary work and uh, we kind of uh, did again uh, analysis of secrecy capacity with uh, transmit uh, source power and uh, source to risk distance and, and so on and so forth just to kind of uh, and then we um, we came up with other uh, you know uh, problems uh, as in you know doubling the transmit power can can we have more effective uh, than the risk cell, for example, what can be the cost benefits, all these are, you do research in one topic, you come up with some result, then it opens up more questions that then we go and explore further, okay? So, so that's kind of a bit of uh, overview on, on um, connected and autonomous vehicles, some work that me and my work, uh, me and my team are working on. The other interesting one that I want to cover here is the electrical, electric vehicle paradigm and, and integrating that within the mobility infrastructure. Why it is important? Because uh, the internal combustion engine cars are not going to be here uh, uh, maybe 10 years time, in 20 years time. It's going to be replaced by EV, right? We are already seeing lots of places from government saying by 2040, we will not have any ICE vehicles, all will be electric vehicles. What is the problem then? We need to understand um, the security aspect of this uh, EV charging infrastructure. Now this is a very preliminary work and uh, uh, we kind of got interested uh, because of this boom of electric vehicles. Uh, it's not like now going into the gas station and then filling petrol or diesel anymore. It's going to be a sophisticated uh, infrastructure network for this charging. Um, where it involves all these links, communication links, different technologies and so on. So we want to see 
what are the different vulnerable points uh, when we have got uh, the charging um, uh, network, uh, charging stations installed at home, at public charging stations, and so on? Because as you can see, it's it's quite a sophisticated um, um, infrastructure that involves network, you know, grids, uh, and, and and so on. So uh, this is kind of a survey work we we did. Um, which is uh, still uh, in progress uh, to get published. Uh, so we looked into for both home charging and public charging network, uh, various attack categories, point of attack, the cause of attack, and possible attack time. So we kind of uh, provided. So if you look into any one of these colors, and then you want to focus on that particular scenario in terms of your research, I think um, that's, um, you know, uh, that that will be very useful. Uh, for example, uh, what happens when there is a communication link failure? Um, what happens when you know someone has physical access to the electric vehicle? Um, and you know denial of service, for example, man in the middle attacks. All, all there are you know if you look into all these different categories. So this was our attempt to understand about. Uh, all the vulnerabilities that exist uh, from cybersecurity point of view um, for the EV charging infrastructure. So again, as I said, it's a very prelim preliminary work, so we'd like to continue working on that. So the first step was to understand about various vulnerabilities. Now we move into um, actually working on some of the solutions to mitigate uh, some of these vulnerabilities. So of course, it's not possible to do it all, uh, which is why we research happens with uh, the overall community, you know, overall, uh, you know, collaboration. So, if you are interested to work on any of this, please uh, do get in touch. So now, move on to another topic, which which I am interested on: Internet of Drones. This is again part of future mobility infrastructure. Okay, so quickly going through. Uh, the architecture, it will have all these layers, drone layer, communication layer, client layer, cloud layer, and you can see it has got, you know, uh, quite sophisticated, it's not just drone that you have got a remote to that, you know, uh, you are controlling, it's actually part of uh, the overall internet. If you are thinking about uh, a particular use case, and that use case can be any of these, probably just the beginning of, of, of this, it will be much more diverse than this uh, going forward. Some of the applications, you know, farming and smart in uh, agriculture, healthcare and medicine, delivery, smart cities and waste management, and, and so on and so forth. This is a, you know, I just kind of took it from uh, one paper, um, it's not my work, but, uh, but as you can see, there are quite a lot of different applications. Uh, we we hear news that Amazon is now you know piloting uh, package delivery using drones. You know we already see uh, fireworks being replaced by uh, drones. You know massive, large, uh, huge amounts of drones, right? Um, so the application of drone will 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 uh, we need to see. Uh, but what will happen then? Cybersecurity challenge, right? And, and as a researcher, I'm interested more on, on the cybersecurity challenges and, and some of the, the challenges. I've listed it out here, you know, diverse uh, device vulnerabilities, uh, because there are different types of smart devices connected uh, with, with uh, uh, the basic problem, uh, password, um, weak passwords, for example, um, making them easy target. Data privacy and protection, network security risk, um, firmware and software integrity, you know, uh, distributed uh, denial attacks, uh, lack of standardization, for example, this is very, uh, very important for us because if there are various manufacturers, um, then it will, everybody will have their own, you know, most of the time proprietary protocols and, and way things work and they are not very keen to share practices. Um, so it, it means that everybody is working different standard and hence it becomes very impossible, difficult to, to employ um, common cyber, cyber security framework. So it means that it needs an industry-wide uh, collaboration to address this. 
Okay, so some mitigation strategies and solutions, again, uh, top level, just like uh, earlier connected and autonomous vehicle, uh, and you might find some parallels uh, with, uh, with uh, CAP, because at the end of the day, uh, cyber security is about risk management. If cyber security is a risk, then you know, uh, working on, on that to mitigate is risk management. So you'll see a lot of similarities. But of course, this will be very much uh, bespoke to uh, drone environment. Okay. So again, the solution that we have for CAV may not be applicable. Definitely will not be applicable. So, so we need to kind of uh, understand it uh, separately. Uh, my own work uh, that I've done with my team, uh, one work, uh, again, I've just started working on drone. Um, so this was one of my uh, initial uh, paper on um, the drone, and we looked into uh, framework, uh, and we focused on physical capture resistant drone framework. Okay, So if we have got all these different drones flying at different zones and connecting with each other, and then you have got a drone user, um, you know, via control room, then um, how do we come up with um, uh, with access control scheme, um, you know, that doesn't allow that that you know that um, mitigates the physical capture problem. Uh, so in this work, we looked into uh, establishing uh, drone to drone drive communication with anonymity and mutual authentication, but uh, with um, uh, mitigating uh, on uh, all the attacks that saw on red um, and with extended key agreement and formal security. So again, the paper is available there if you are interested. And again, it's just a start. We need to do more. Uh, we need to do more. If uh, you know, we are to embed these um, uh, technologies uh, within our society. Now, this is the last slide, just to summarize. Uh, and what I uh, kind of been saying up to now, uh, cyber security is a critical pillar for uh, seamless integration of emerging technological landscape into our lives and society. Without cyber security, the digital transformation will simply not work. Okay, it's not sustainable. We need to work on strengthening defenses. It needs to be a collaborative effort because it will involve not just technical uh, solutions, but we need people, you know, from. Uh, law background from uh, you know, policy makers, we need regulations that, you know, uh, uh, where we can have uh, regula uh, regulations in terms of um, all these new technologies being uh, implemented. The key one is again fostering confidence, how we can, uh, you know, uh, gain that confidence from the public to, to um, start implementing and using the technology that user acceptance uh, to in, in uh, to start using this digital technology again that's uh, like I said earlier we as a technical people should be advocate uh, for these technologies to be implemented and of course with with reasons and and with with data and so on for example when you talk about AI they talk about ethical AI now right? Is it ethical um, or not? So people are really worried if AI is going to replace uh, all the uh, you know work that's done by human beings. So again, that challenge uh, from AI point of view, similar from technical adoption point of view. So we need to make sure that you know from cybersecurity point of view, we are providing that confidence um, and you know a visionary future by embracing all the possible. Um, innovation opportunities but being responsible implementing proactive cyber security practice uh, we need to make sure the future is safe and uh, efficient uh, for the connected mobility okay so thank you very much for listening You have got any questions uh, about the presentation, about you know anything uh, about Huddersfield, about the joint programs, or anything that you would like to uh, ask us? We'll be more than happy to answer you. Or 
just talk about Manchester United and Manchester City. I'm happy with that as well. Thank you. 